It will go down as one of the best private equity deals ever. Over the 19 years, they put $226 million in to Weight Watchers and got $5.37 billion out, $4.7 billion of realized profits. All right, what's up? Uh, we are back and we got another episode. Uh, we got a guest here today. Maytab is here. He's a he's a friend of mine who most people I think probably probably haven't heard of unless you're in the DTC world or you're on Twitter or you know what's going on in that in that area. But uh, I want to introduce you because you're somebody who a has helped me a bunch with my DTC brand. You like know a bunch of tips and tricks and hacks and shit like that. So I'm like, I basically have a little scoreboard in my head and everybody's attributes are there. And then yours, it was like business hacks was like filled up. And then the other thing was that you, I don't know if you listen to the show regularly, but you would send me little nuggets of like, oh, you should talk about this. You should talk about this. And so I kind of got confidence. I was like, oh, I think he's just got his back pocket full of interesting stories that are off the beaten path. And so I kind of like that. Do you listen to the show first? Let's start there. Yeah, all the time, almost religiously. So Sam, my I go-to sent- shower podcast. Oh, that's that's perfect. Uh, we are the number one rated shower podcast actually. in the country, actually. <laughs> Millions of men <laughs> lather to us. So, uh, Sam, I sent him a picture of uh, the Vancouver show where, like, the stadium or, like, the, uh, the theater was filled up. And he goes, wow, oh, that's a lot of virgins. And I- <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So true. That's a good point. My, my fiance listens to the show religiously too. And she wouldn't use chat GPT when I told her about it, maybe a month or two ago. And you guys mentioned it the other day and she was sending me screenshots. So you guys caught her using that. Dude, the Darmesh <laughs> pod. I, I think you're referring to the Darmesh pod. I've been using yeah, it all yeah, weekend literally. after talking to him. Uh, I implemented a lot of the stuff that he was talking about. Man, he got me hyped up. Also, what a lot of people don't realize this is Darmesh pods always get tons of views on YouTube. And finally, Sean like texted Darmesh in a group <laughs> chat and was like, hey, Darmesh, what are you uh, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, nothing, <laughs> really. And I go, really? <laughs> and he goes, well, I'm just doing a few things. And he like <laughs> gave this like very detailed list of like Internet marketing, not hacks, but he was like, I'm just like testing, like buying ads, like $500 here just to test this. And then I'm like responding to comments, (laughs) just like the small stuff that you wouldn't expect someone who runs a $20 billion company to like be doing. And it is very tactical. We don't even do it with our, it's our own podcast. We don't do any of this stuff. Like people are like, oh, the thumbnail, the the title. People don't realize we don't see those. We don't approve those. We don't know about those. We're not involved in it. Uh, We don't do a lot of this stuff that we probably should, but, uh, you know, can't be bothered to do all that stuff, but he did, he did do it. They say, and- they say the devil's in the details and I ain't trying to hang out with him. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> he's the man. Like he was like, Oh, I'm not doing anything. And then he had this like really long list. Actually. Maytab, you said a phrase that, to me the other day, uh, I called you and you said a phrase that I've stole and I've just been saying all around town. I've just been saying it everywhere, even when it's not really appropriate because I thought it was so funny. Sam, I was talking to him and I was like, oh, you lived in like, are you like, you're living in Utah? Why Utah? Like, you're, aren't you like Canadian? And you're like Indian? Like, what's going on here? And he was like, uh, he's like, oh yeah, my wife, something, something. And I go, I asked you something about your wife. And he goes, he goes, yeah, you know, me, he goes, yeah, you know, uh, I, I look like I got beat with the ugly stick, but somehow I ended up with an awesome looking wife. And I thought it that happens. It happens. It's common here. Beat with the ugly stick was so funny. <laughs> I've been using that everywhere. I use it to refer to my business partner all the time. So, good. <laughs> oh, you take him down with you? Oh, always. Yeah. He's my go to. So. I don't know. I Googled okay. him. He, he's pretty handsome. How, um, how, how old are you? Uh, I'm 29. Wow. I'm and looking you're at interesting because he does stuff that like you say words that um, most people don't say. So I, I pay attention to vocabulary. So for example, in the tech world, in the, me and Sam used to live in San Francisco and uh, you couldn't go outside. You couldn't poke your ear out the window. You wouldn't hear the word EBITDA. Nobody says EBITDA in San Francisco. Nobody knows about it. Nobody talks about it. It's not a thing. But then when you get into like the cash flow business kind of world, that's all you're going to hear. A bunch, of, a bunch of different people talking about words that have to do with profits. You say a bunch of other words like uh, dividend recap, distressed buyout. And he talks about all these things that I frankly don't know what they mean, what they do, how it works. But I know that, that you come from a little different world. So I'm excited because I want to talk about some ideas 
from your the, your neck of the woods, your part of the business world that is less uh, stuff I'm less familiar with personally. And so I think I'm going to I'm going to learn a little bit. Where where do you want to start? What 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 topic should we start on? You sent a doc with some things. I want to I want to look at some of these. Let's start with one that well, we hold had. on, Sean. I need a little bit of background here. So mm. you you basically uh, I like I read your Medium post. So if I understand this correctly, uh, the name of your holding company, you guys buy into or you buy entirely outright uh, distressed or D- only OK performing D to C brands and you make them great. Is is that the summary? Yeah, that's the gist of it. And we're less of a hold co and more of a um, an independent sponsor if that makes sense. And that just means you do everything on a deal-by-deal basis. So the equity that you're working with might be very different on a deal-by-deal basis. That doesn't make sense. I don't understand. What (laughs) what do you mean when you say sponsor? Um, So it just means that we're the ones making the investment. And say on one deal, Sean's a co-investor with us. And then on the next deal, only Sam's on the cap table with us. And you run it or you hire CEOs or what? Um, it depends on the, the portfolio company. Right now, I am day to day with one of our portfolio companies. And um, how many do you cars. have? Like seven, I think. No, there, there's three platform companies, and then there's another eight to ten kind of minority equity and debt positions that we have. And the whole thing is roughly of what size, so uh, me and listeners understand. Um, the core platform companies, which is what I would count as part of the revenue, because we own the majority of those companies, is well into eight figures. Um, it's kind of that that mid eight figure range. And is the biggest one the the flowers company? No, that one's slightly smaller than the succulent company, but the flower company is the one I'm most bullish on. That one's solowoodflowers.com. And that's just because um there's a lot of room for margin expansion yet. So what's I that? Mean, that's the one you, that's the one you talk about the most. So so let's give let's give let's give you said three platform companies. So you said a succulent company, mm-hmm. a, a solo wood flowers. So it's a like a wood or fake flower company, correct? Yep. Made uh, made in our motherland, Sean. That yeah, me exactly. So made in India, people buy them for like weddings and things like that, right? Because flowers are yep. super, super expensive at weddings, and so these look really good, but they don't cost as much as fresh flowers or whatever. Exactly. What's the what's the third like majority owned company? Um, that one's an apparel company. An apparel company. Okay. Yeah. And so um, you own these three. Let's talk before we go into the details about each of these. Um, I want to know the origin story because you've told me you've told me some interesting things. Like I think you met your co-founder on Reddit, like in a subreddit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so get, take us back. Uh, go, go all the way to. I see here something about 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 getting sick at seventeen. St- t- start there and then tell us the story of how how you got to this this spot now when you're twenty nine years old. Yeah. So the quick and dirty version is essentially um, diagnosed with spinal stenosis and degenerative disc disease when I was seventeen. Um, so that meant you know obviously doing anything physical for work was kind of out of, out of the picture. Um, so I decided to learn more about e-commerce and entrepreneurship and just kind of stumbled. Um, I, I started a, a Facebook page called Guitar Porn. And this is back when organic reach was awesome. You know, you post something, people would actually see it. Facebook blessed us with so much free organic reach. It was the greatest time ever. Um, almost like TikTok is now, right? And then um, I transitioned. I started doing basically guitar runs, like semi-custom guitar runs with big brands. And we'd partner with a, a retailer, a dealer. This is before brands would work with you directly, right? And we would sell out these pre-order runs and basically take a cut. Eventually, we cut out the retailer and became the retailer ourselves. Uh, that got to kind of low seven figures. That was nice because there was no CapEx. So we didn't have to have much cash, right? It's all pre-orders. Um, after that, I started a men's hair product company, which is really ironic because I'm, I'm Sikh. Um, so I, I don't cut my hair and I have a turban. <laughs> and... Uh, so did, did that with one of my best friends that also scaled to kind of low seven figures along with a guitar pedal company that scaled to low seven figures. And then after that, I decided, um, you know, these are all fairly small, like Tam's really small for niche guitar pedals. Um, so I decided to start investing, realized, hey, you know, no one's going to come to me. Just give it right. nobody. You, you weren't even doing guitars. You were doing guitar pedals specifically. Uh, so the first company was a guitar retailer like actual full-blown guitars and then yeah the one that was really profitable was guitar pedals just because the margin was insane and i partnered with a um, a guy who i'd met flipping guitars like just trading guitars with and he was a grammy nominated guitarist or he is um he plays in a band called periphery for any metal nerds and uh so that went well like those were both flowing well in terms of cash but, but were just your, such small opportunities were your products any good or were they kind of you were just good at the marketing because that's my that's my kind of uh rub with a lot of ddc companies is mm-hmm. uh they have pretty shitty products but slick marketing 
Um, what a- no, the products are awesome. I mean, I had like 30 or 40,000 posts in guitar forums by the time I was 18. So I really was into guitar. I used to play six to 10 hours a day. So I, uh, I definitely knew what it took to make a good product. So, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of these companies, like I'll see them like, dude, these are shit. Or like, this is some Alibaba crap that's just wrapped up in something a little totally. bit nicer, but it's still pretty crap. <laughs> totally. Like there's no R&D that like made it a, a superior product. You know what I'm saying? Especially with like a lot of the cosmetic stuff, like lotions and stuff. I'm like, I don't know, man, this is kind of crappy. So did you go to college? Because it sounds like you were doing these when you were like 18, 19, 20, 21. Is that right? Yeah, so I was in school and then I dropped out. Um, it just didn't make sense to stay in school. What did your Indian parents what was the, think about that? Oh, uh, they were not, they were not big fans of it. That was, yeah. What was your like dropout point? Was it like, I'm making X dollars and the X was just like too big for, to, or you just didn't have the time to go to school? What, why did you drop out? Um, it just didn't seem like the value was there relative to who I was, I had the opportunity to interact with on the business end. And, um, it just seemed like there was more opportunity there. If that makes sense, then obviously I was doing okay in terms of cash flow. So, um, so, so how old were you when you made your, you know, this podcast called My First Million? How old were you when you ended up making your first million? Um, in cash or, or equity? Yeah, cash. Cash. Um, I don't know. I'd probably put it like mid 20s, early 20s, like okay. 24, 25. And so you, you did that through these kind of like smaller e com things. And then how'd you get into this kind of like private equity style thing where you go and you buy these distressed companies and you turn them around? So how did that happen? Yeah, so in the Great Recession, when I was a kid reading about it, I always thought it was interesting reading about the private equity firms that made money no matter what, like if the company did well or it failed. And I thought, hey, that sounds great. Uh, I hate being an entrepreneur because obviously if the company doesn't do well, you fail, right? And that's still the case. It's not like, you know, um, it's just not as black and white anymore. So. I started, um, I just realized the TAM. Explain that. Why would, uh, why would it make, why would it work whether the company does well or not, not does well? (laughs) Explain how that works. Yeah, we can jump into that a little later, but part of our thesis is essentially investing on how much liquidity or cash the company can generate in a short-term basis. Um, So if you can invest today and pull most of your cash out within two or three months, there's a lot less risk, right? Um, Versus say you bootstrap something new, you're always putting more and more cash um, on the working capital side. You need to fuel growth, right? If, if you're doing a traditional consumer brand, that's less of an issue for something asset like, like SaaS, right? Um, yeah. But but that's the case, then you, you don't actually end up pulling cash out of it for so long. So where most people focus on equity appreciation, you guys focus on liquidity. You guys focus on how quickly can we pull cash out, whereas most business people just think, how do I make this worth more, which often results in putting more cash in. Is that correct? Right. And that's just one facet of it. We're okay with holding for the long term or being more long term focused if if it makes sense. And sometimes we're just more of a short term partner. And like, uh, it's not uncommon for a software company to sell on the low end for three times revenue on the high end if it's fast growing ten times revenue. What you just said was you're going to buy a company for basically uh, 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 one sixth times <laughs> because you said you want to get your cash in. I can't do that math, but you want to get your your cash back in two or three months. So you're buying it at one six times profit or ca- uh, of cash flow. I mean, like like nothing. So right? g- give us uh, give us a sample deal economics. So uh, in a situation where that happened. Yeah. So we invested in an adult health and wellness retailer, um, which is a nice way of saying sex toys. Um, <laughs> that's I'm in Utah, so you know. But I, what, what, I why don't you ever say phrase. the name of the brands? Because you don't want to you don't want to talk about it. Um, well, if they're distressed, it's just kind of. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah, just culturally kind of mean to them. So I, I'm not like that. But the, and I, I can send them over. I think I shot them over to Sean. But um, yeah, so we, we invested essentially at, um, I'd say a fairly far below market valuation just because others were unwilling to invest in, a, in that kind of company. And this was 2018, back when it was a little bit more taboo than it is now. Um, now there's a few publicly venture funded brands like Dame, et cetera in that space. So it's become more socially acceptable, but we, we got in far below kind of market valuation. Uh, well, the well, comp- give, give us a, give yeah. us a sense. So revenue was about X and then what was yeah. the distress? Well, why was it distressed? They had too much inventory. They had a debt problem. What was the problem? I would say it was more of a case of really bad margins. Um, and there was a clear case to improve those margins. They were so just originally a drop shipper. They're doing like 6 million a year. This is one of our first deals. So they're very small. They're only doing 6 million a year. Um, and I'd say market, for that, for valuation, like the growth equity side would have been like 10, 15 million. As far as valuation back then, um, we got in at like one and then the company paid us a royalty until we were 
paid back in full on that initial cash investment. And then there's a few other kind of structural things going in, but we got involved and we helped boot up their initial ops. Why, why would a company like that sell for $1 million? I think that's, I think if I'm listening, that's my question, right? Like, yeah, wait, he said they're no, doing totally. $6 million and normally that's like $10 million of value, but they bought it for one. Well, and how you are you, how are you just it. Mr. Charming or what? why were you able to, to buy it yeah. for that, that price? So that one was a minority equity investment. And we got involved like really hands-on operationally. So my co-founder, he jumped in and he helped them boot up their, their physical operations and transition from a drop shipper to holding their own inventory and booting up ops here in Utah. Um, he helped them launch that facility, make their first few hires, GMs, et cetera. And then I helped them raise um, debt to fuel growth. And that kind of took them from that six to 12-ish mark. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And then um, we sold our equity um, just via secondaries to, to a VC firm that invested later once that value had been created. Okay, gotcha. Um, so, so continue on. So you, you, uh, you've done some of these, okay, so you see, so, so I want to go back to, to sort of how did you get this idea? So you, you read about this, you're like, all right, private equity has this trait where they can buy stuff at a certain price or on certain terms so that they get their money back quickly, whether they, they you know, their equity portion is small. Uh, they have a lot of debt and they get the money back quickly. Uh, you read about that. But still, you've never done that. So how'd you decide to actually go do it? How'd you figure out how to do it? Yeah, so I just started posting on Reddit um, to try and find initial deal flow. And then I met Which subreddit? one guy, um, just the entrepreneurship one. So I met my co-founder, who I still work with now, Alex, um, through that subreddit. And then I met a lady who was one of the first few engineering hires at Uber Eats. Um, and she actually ended up retiring like eight months after we started working together when, when Uber IPO'd. Um, and then the other one was someone with a very traditional background in private equity. And he's the one who kind of taught me a lot about private equity. And you're just what building a relationship through Reddit DMS or like, how are you like, I don't meet anyone on Reddit. <laughs> what, what is actually happening here? Sounds like you met some pretty it's, high quality people and actually trusted them enough to partner with them. Yeah. It's the same way you meet people through Twitter, I guess. Right. Um, just posting, getting to know people. I'd say that the community there is very low quality, uh, on Reddit versus Twitter. And some other private forums like, you know, EO, YPO, uh, what Sam has going on, right? Um, so it, there was a lot of filtering to be done, but we did sorts of deal through that. Um, that's how the succulent company was was found. Okay, gotcha. Um, okay, so Sam, what do you want to do from here? You want to talk a little bit about this like flower company thing, or you Dude. want to talk about other brands that, that that he's got on this list? I want to talk, you have, you have, uh, three well wow well, shit you have five categories or four three categories you have frameworks you have interesting ideas and opportunities and then you have under the radar companies i would like to start at number one under the radar companies sure. i read those i read that reverse order number one under the radar companies you have things that i've never heard of and i like i'm pretty good at finding these unheard of things yeah, so let's start with a simple one. So t tell us about Josh's Frogs <laughs> and yeah, like this what, is what a, are these types of companies? This is one of my favorite companies. It has all the characteristics of a company we'd love to invest in. Um, and I've, I've been trying to invest in it since 2018, but he, he always says no. So it's okay though, I still love him. So basically Josh's Frogs does exactly what it sounds like. They, I don't know if you call it farming, breeding. They breed their own fro frogs and their exotics. And they also grow the bugs that they eat and they sell the food. They do all of that in-house in Michigan and they ship it to customers. So if Sam wants a frog tomorrow, he can order one from Josh's Frogs. And they've scaled really cleanly, totally bootstrapped. Josh is awesome. I called him on a Sunday and the guy was catching frogs with his kids. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. You know, I think he's been doing this for 15, 20 years and uh, he's, he still loves frogs. And frogs oh, wait, basically... Sam, do you know the price of a frog? I'm looking, you know what frogs are going for? <laughs> dude, I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it now. I would have thought like... So you could buy a chicken at tractor uh, tractor supply for like five bucks, like a chick. Or yeah. frogs are way more expensive. This is a and they're not frog. delicious. <laughs> yeah, I mean the the frogs here range. The most expensive one is four hundred dollars. It looks like the average one is like sixty to a hundred bucks for a frog. So these are, are they're beautiful, but like you know, I don't, these are for pets. Like people want a pet frog, so they go oh, buy totally. this, yeah. this uh, sixty dollar black poisonous dart frog. All right, it's fair mm -hmm. enough. Uh, Later on, you, you guys should watch the uh, tour of his facilities. It's really cool. And so you like this business because what? Um, so what I what I really like is the steep ops mode. So no one else, your typical e-commerce guy is not going to go out and boot up a frog operation, right? Um, it, it's just too intense for them. They don't really like physical things. We have to show up. A lot of guys just use three PLs. 
And it requires a lot of specialized knowledge. At the same time, you know that someone overseas is not going to undercut you. And it doesn't become a race to the bottom with commoditized products because you, you can't really ship a live frog from China or directly overseas to the U.S. It's just not viable. Thank God. So with that, there's a very strong operating mode. You're only really competing against other companies in the U.S., right? So your, yeah. your so, cost so per acquisition He's competing against like only people weirder than himself, which is yeah, exactly. only going to be like three other dudes in the country. Yeah, your CPA, your, your cost per acquisition of customers stays consistent. doesn't really spike the way you see it spike in other um, like you know, spaces. Josh's frogs, Jack's frogs, Sam's frogs, and you know her, Herbert's frogs. Those are the, that's the, the big four in the frog industry. <laughs> if you're Josh, if you're Josh, if you're Josh from Josh's frogs, what what would you sell this business for? Or like, what would be the threshold of, okay, this is interesting, I'll take the offer. Or I'll maybe take the offer. Yeah, I obviously I can't say what his EBITDA is. And if I gave you a multiple, I would kind of tell you what his EBITDA is. But I would say there's probably, let, let's say your average D2C business, his size might sell, and I'll just use a range for eight to 10X. He would get a premium of a few turns on top of that because of that operations boat. And it's not something anyone can just knock off, right? Yeah, it's this super super defensible. Um, yeah. Okay. So, and how did you even find this? You know this guy personally, or you found oh, it? Yeah, I meet him. I I met him through. Uh, I did a podcast on e-commerce fuel, and then he reached out, and we just got along. And I I always stay in touch with him. We like to nerd out. We have similar problems with our businesses, so it's fun to discuss them with him, like implementing lean, etc. So. By the way, I just read. Uh, I just googled Josh's Frog revenue. So it looks like they're on the Inc. Five thousand. So you can find it there. But according to some articles, they're in the range of like $15 million a year in terms of frogs. I don't know if that's accurate, and I haven't actually researched it, but that's like a, just some top searches that are showing that. That's pretty wild. Yeah, I think they're they're bigger than that now. That's yeah, this wild. Guy is, uh, there's a picture of him on the About page, and he just looks so happy. This guy looks like he's, he's great. in frog heaven right now. I'm so happy for this guy. Just this one picture. Just like I, I, I hope to be as happy as this man right here. Um, this is a good one. I like this. And I, I think... What's cool when you so invent in in the sort of like tech world, right? All the discussion is always just about like the future dream, like the dream end state. It's like, what could this be if everything goes great? And what I've learned as I talk to guys like Andrew Wilkinson or the guys from Enduring Ventures or you, people who are buying, who want to buy, you know, solid, stable, cash flowing businesses that are profitable. Um, that's not the, you know, it's not the pie in the sky sort of thinking that you get in Silicon Valley. And instead, it's basically what could go wrong. So instead of what, what could go right, it's what could go wrong if I bought this company. Right. And um, that's why people love businesses like this that are, that have this like, you know, defensibility, this moat. So it's like, no one's going to compete with me, not internationally, because you literally can't ship the frog. Locally, mo you know, the average e-commerce bro is not going to want to like take this on. No. Um, so who am I competing against? I'm competing against basically nobody, which will let me, th which means my business is extremely defensible. And so it's just a different way of thinking that is less common when it comes to tech, which is sort of like half asking you grow, um, you know, can this become huge? Can this become a unicorn? It's a different sort of like mindset altogether. Um, what's another example of an under the radar business that that's worth talking about? Talk about this fast yeah. growing trees one. I think that one's a great example. So similar, similar, similar operations, but where obviously they're kind of growing the trees. And again, no one wants to be a tree farmer, right? It's just not sexy. No one's going to go out and raise capital to become a tree farmer. Maybe, oh no, that well sounds all right. That sounds kind of neat to me. Wait, so so literally, what what what, what is it? They sell seeds or they sell the actual <laughs> tree? What's going on? Both. And the company, I I first stumbled across the sim when the company was being sold six or seven years ago. And I think it went for between 100 million to 120 million. And it looks like they've grown quite a bit since then. I wouldn't be surprised if they're worth closer to double that now, just with their website rehaul, et cetera. They had a very like Dude, early their traffic estimate before. shows it went from, it's like at almost 3 million uniques a month. That's pretty crazy for a yeah. tree website. Their website it's says so cool. uh, flower. So here's their H1 flowering trees are it. You'd hate to miss out on the hottest <laughs> trees of the season, wouldn't you? Shop now over 1.5 million happy customers. And so what you see is, I don't know what type of tree this is, but it's like a grown tree that's purple. It, it does look beautiful. It looks, it's a beautiful tree. And uh, I just think it's hilarious. You'd, uh, you'd hate to flowering miss out on the trees. house. <laughs> flowering trees are it. That's like, you know, like the like Gen Z people are like, 
he is him, <laughs> she is her. Have you seen this like this trend? <laughs> Flower trees are it. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really defensible business. It's cool. Um, it kind of no no one re- would really expect something like that to be that large, right? And so, what do you buy? Um, you buy a tree that's mostly grown already, and then they come and plant it. Uh, I think you plant it. I think it shows up, and then you plant it. Oh my in god! In your property. So if you want, if you want a tree to like uh, for more privacy, say privacy hedges or something similar. Or just trees in general. This is where you go. How much remedy do you think get, they do? Get your fix. Um, I have no clue now. Again, I'd be really surprised if it was less than a hundred million in revenue. This is yeah, crazy. I'd say probably close to like one fifty. And what type of prop? What about uh, net margins? Would this be your net income or EBITDA? Uh, I'd be really surprised if it was below twenty percent. Probably closer to 20, 25. This is crazy. And they probably don't, I, they probably aren't buying too many ads. I, I They had a couple of Google ads, but like, it seems, I bet you this is a type of company that they, I mean, they called their company fast growing trees for a reason. I, I imagine that was a search thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's an older company. It's been around for a while um, under a few different owners. I think a private equity firm runs it now. And who would have thought that like, you know, when the internet came out, it's like, yeah, people are going to be able to like buy things online. It's like, there's some guy out there who's like, They'll buy trees online. <laughs> it's like, a, no, no, no way, no way. Why would I buy a tree online? That sounds like the most far fetched thing. And then here we are, hundred million dollars selling fast growing trees online. You could buy this, by the way. Look at this Italian cypress. It's like this. That'd like, be perfect for the Airbnb, Sam. Yeah, I Level am. Up I, a bit. I'm looking at this, and I think this is pretty awesome. Like I like the, <laughs> it, it, it's. They have some beautiful hedges. There's like uh, fruit trees. I mean, this is pretty amazing. I understand this. I'm getting to the age now to where I appreciate a good tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is pretty crazy. Okay, I like this one. Give us another under the radar business. Yeah, um, what seems more appealing to you? The um, first. Well, let's do the Betty's one, and then we've talked uh, about this CSC generation thing, and we yeah. should. But you have more info on it than than we do. So let's do Betty's and then do the CSC. Yeah, so Betty's is a really interesting business. What I love about it is strong IP mode. So if you go to their website, um, well, you explain, can tell explain it's what they do. What, what do they do? It's like a bed cover thing for kids. I actually don't know how to explain it very well. Um, <laughs> but it may, it's so your kids can basically change their bedding really easily. But they have it, it's patented and they have proper IP mode. And when you go to their website, you can tell it's not very optimized, but they've been crushing it, totally bootstrapped, great people, a very healthy EBITDA margin. And, um, you it's know, a, that IP it's, mo- a, it's a duvet cover. It's a duvet cover that's yeah. easy to zip, which I have a zip duvet cover as well. The duvet covers are, are a pain in the butt to, to, yeah, to, to do. It's meant for little boys. So that makes sense. Um, <laughs> 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 so this, uh, they bootstrap this to 40 million. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it's right around there. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. And you can tell it's all PMF, like killer product market fit, killer product, killer IP mode. And um, they've done a really good job with that end of the business. What do you think are some of the, ad- like, uh, I, I, I don't think this is like, a, everything can perfectly do this. But I think that when you like look at like a software company, you think, all right, so right. what are the attributes of like a great software company that could scale? You think like, well, they have to have good net retention, meaning most people re- come back constantly. Uh, ideally, you can. Ha- it's an expensive enough product that you can afford to hire a sales team. Uh, right. thing, like things like this. Like there's like a handful of checklists, and then there's lots of examples of things that don't ch- check the checklist that still succeed. But what are the handful of of check boxes that you have when looking at uh, or building a D2C company? Particularly things that people don't think are true. Like for example, like in the cool kid circle, and when you're 22, you want to create like, you know, cool shit that Gen right. Z buys. You're None of nothing that you've mentioned fits in that category, right? For us, what we found is the most consistent moat, and some people are, are different, right? This is just the moat that's worked for us is that operating moat. So, anything that requires physical manufacturing, it has a good reason for that manufacturing to be in the US or Mexico is great. Um, and we found that, like, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with lean manufacturing, um, it's just like a philosophy behind, I guess, running a manufacturing operation, like a Toyota thing, right? Yeah, exactly. It, it ports over very cleanly from company to company, but marketing does not, right? What worked with your paid ads for a company with, let's say, low AOV, but really fast consideration period. So, you know, something like clothing. I see clothing, I buy it. It's very simple compared to the marketing side for something with a long consideration period that's very different, different teams, totally different strategy. 
nothing will really carry over cleanly. But on the manufacturing end, it, it carries over cleanly company to company to company. Um, so for us, that's that's our favorite mode. So it, it's summarize, you you want a low consideration period and you want something that can be made in America because it has some type of manufacturing mode. Anything else? Well, Sorry. We, we don't actually care about the consideration period. Um, I think it's just like a natural challenge in any vertical that you get into, right? Um, if, if that's there. But for us, we only really care about the manufacturing end now. And then obviously the way we enter the deal is really important too. Um, and that just, you know, if you pay next to nothing for something, the odds of making it work and making money on it are much, much higher than if you overpay on entry. I want to talk about it, this agency stuff because, you know, the interesting thing about, you know, people like you in the D2C world is they're oftentimes really, really good at acquiring customers because it's right. kind of like, like the D2C folks oftentimes are pretty good now. Before it was the gaming company. So like if you met someone right. from a gaming company or from the ad tech totally. world, like that meant that their internet marketing chops were like pretty good. Now that uh, D2C or now that Facebook is harder to buy ads on, the people who are succeeding oftentimes are quite good at that. And Sean and I have a bunch of friends who are starting recruiting companies. And right. which is really interesting because recruiting companies isn't new. Outsourcing isn't new, but people are putting oh. sexy new packaging on it. And I guess from what I'm guessing, because you have it on here, is they're doing a really good job or historically they've done a poor job of acquiring customers and you want to apply that to that space. Is that right? Yeah, I just think it's a really interesting space in general. But um, I, I think some of these agencies are really heavily focused on, say, the Philippines or other countries in Southeast Asia. Um, we've noticed there's a lot higher quality talent in places like Mexico, and you don't lose the same negatives associated with hiring in the Philippines are not there in Mexico. So for example, you could build an office out there and fly out and be there in person in a few hours if you live in Texas, right? And the wage disparity is not as high as you would think for really, really good talent. You're only paying, a, this is a large number, but you know it's not actually that bad, a 30% more than you would be for someone who's great in the Philippines, maybe 40% more in Mexico. But again, you can visit them in person, which is really big. You can have them fly out. And again, it's big for us because we do a lot of manufacturing, right? So they can actually understand the product or interact with the team in person. So your retention goes up. The quality of work is much higher. And we've found the quality of applicants is much, much higher in Mexico too. Um, so if I did start an agency, it would be focused on solely talent in Mexico. And um, uh, just for, for example, when we're hiring a customer service role, like a new manager or director, um, we're getting people who used to head up Uline. Are you guys familiar with Uline? I just use it to buy like boxes. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we yeah. use it a ton for like the when we had our, our warehouse. Yeah, so their customer service is awesome. But we got one of their former directors and his salary ask was really reasonable. It was like, I think $5,000 a month, but his talent was the equivalent of someone who's $200,000 in the US. I can't find this client info. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform, so it shares its data across every application. Every team can stay aligned. No out of sync spreadsheets or dueling databases. HubSpot, grow better. Yeah, uh, you have one agency idea on here that I think is a is a no brainer, uh, which is site speed. So yes. we have this problem with our store, but I think everybody has everybody has this problem. Like, uh, yep. basically, if you're selling something on the internet, one of the easiest levers, the biggest levers you have is your site speed, because if you have a slow loading thing, you're just going to lose traffic. You're going to lose customers. Totally. Um, as you have a slow loading page, you're also going to suffer in terms of your Google rank because Google takes into account your, your page speed as well. And it's really easy in the e-com space to have slow pages because what happens is you start with a Shopify store, you install 15 plugins just to get your, your Shopify store to do anything. Cause it, like you, you can't basically run a Shopify store just out of the box. You have to, you're going to end up installing a bunch of apps and each app injects a bunch of code into your page. And even if you delete the app, the code stays. There's yep. no like you have to like manually clean that up, which is kind of insane and probably a business of its own. But basically, site speed is a problem that we I think we've hired three different folks to try to fix our site speed. And all of them, I'm like, they claim to do something. I have no idea really if they're if they're doing a great job or not. Um I don't think that they are because the next guy comes in and says, Oh man, your site speed sucks. Let me fix it. <laughs> so um so I think this is a it is a, a product that I wish existed and I think could clean up because it's a it's clearly accretive to the person. But explain your thinking on it. What did I miss? Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really require much in terms of dev skill. It's not like you don't have to be great uh, at the dev end to actually do most of these changes. 
And it's almost like a checklist. It's very portable company to company to company. It applies very cleanly. Um, so for example, changing the order in which your pixels fire for Google Analytics, Facebook ads, et cetera, you can delay some of those very slightly and dramatically increase site speed, and it won't really hurt the business that much. Right. Um, that's just an example of one quick fix you could do. Or certain apps do not compress images properly. So judge me, the review app on Shopify for, for a lot of sites, um, it does not properly compress images. So if you just apply more compression to those images, your site speed goes up at the product display page level or wherever those reviews are. So how uh, yeah. would you acquire new customers for this? Um, honestly, I would probably just just go. Um, have you guys used Built With before? Yeah. yeah. We love it. Yeah, just go to Built With, full list of websites, make sure they're they're doing a certain amount of revenue or at least have meaningful revenue coming in. Um, just cross check that against um, something that shows traffic, right? Like Alexa or something. And um, from there, I think you would just ping them if their site's slow, right? Yeah, just cold email, I think is, yeah. is the way to go with this. If somebody out there wants totally. to do a site speed uh, shop, just DM me because this is a no brainer. I'll be your first customer and I'll help you get the next 10 because you could even just charge this. You could charge purely on contingency too. It's really cool because you can see a black and white effect yeah. um, if you've done a good job. And again, it's really easy to do a good job. It's just nobody specializes in this for some reason. So, yeah. And it's a moving target. Like uh, you'll do it. And mm -hmm. then, like six to 12 months later, they'll need it again because they've installed a few more things. They hired somebody who didn't know how to compress images before putting it up. They started using this new tracking software for hot, for heat maps. And then boom, now you need it again because you, you've gone exactly. from an A rank back to a C, C rank yep. on these like these site speed graders that are, that are out there. I'm surprised the, the site speed graders don't have these agencies, or maybe they do. I haven't actually looked, but like, does GT Matrix or one of these companies that have the, the site speed score, do they not set, offer a button that says, by the way, we could fix this for you? No, they should though, to your point. Oh my it's God. Really easy, especially if all these e commerce sites are on Shopify, right? It's very like, yeah. checklist. Yeah. So that's the other move. You should buy that site. You should buy the site speed site that checks the speed and then just add this button at the end. That's the agency service to, uh, to fix the problem. If they don't do that already, that's kind of crazy. Um, how are you? Uh, how are you balancing your time? It seems like you've got a bunch of stuff going on, and these, I mean, you know, ideas are worthless, but it seems like a pretty good idea to me. When I hear when I'm hearing this, I'm like, oh, that's kind of an interesting. I actually seems like that has legs. You've got a good network. You could probably spin something up fairly quickly and scale nicely. Uh, how are you balancing doing everything that you're doing? Um, about 15% of my time is on the investment end and managing our minority equity and credit positions. And then the rest of the time is just spent on the floral business. Um, there's a pretty big lever that we're pulling right now with booting up uh, another operating base, like a manufacturing base in Mexico. And that'll get our EBITDA to kind of five or six million. And then from there, it's it's a pretty good valuation. So we just want to get that over the hump. And then I'll probably slowly phase out. But my co-founder is solely involved in that company. And that's the that's called Solo Wood Flowers? Yeah, yeah. Sam, when I uh, met Mezab, I, I heard what he was doing. I was like, um, I, I told him two things. I, I think I go, how do I invest in this? Because uh, if you're willing to go down and move to Mexico and build your manufacturing facility, you're going to win. Like um, Paul Graham has this uh, essay that he wrote called Sh like Schlepp. And he basically describes the guys from Stripe. Um, as being willing to do do the schlep work. And he's like, you know, in a lot of businesses, there's basically some amount of schlep that you have to do. And for Stripe, they had to do all this like banking stuff that was kind of like annoying and bureaucratic, but they didn't really view it that way. They were A, they were so young, they didn't really know what all was going to happen. They, they didn't really realize how much they would have to do. And B, they were just willing to do it. And, um, and you know, you, you are willing to do the schlep. Like you're like, oh, you know, you're like, I'm looking for operationally intensive things. That's the opposite of what I'm interested in. I'm like, I want the least operationally intensive thing, but I get why you would want it because it's super defensible once you have it. It's very valuable right. once you do it. Um, and it's very simple once it's fully set up, if that makes sense. Once you have once you have like the best practices from lean manufacturing running, it's very simple to keep the manufacturer running versus like a D2C brand that's really reliant on the marketing end, right? Yeah, exactly. And so I told you, I remember being like, hey, can I invest in your Mexico thing, like your facility there? I think that's a great idea. And then I also told you, I was like, man, I feel like you play the game on hard mode. You're super smart. And uh, you are like, I'm going to go do distressed turnarounds of D2C businesses. That's like multiplying three hard things together. 
Um, <laughs> and I was like, why do you do this? You could just, do, like, you know, there's easier options. And you were like, no, I like this. I like, you know, it's I fun. like playing it's, in the mud. <laughs> once you get a really good deal, you can't go back. I'm, I'm Indian. I need to get a good deal. I need to get a good price. So. <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually what it is. I think it's genetic that you're like, oh, you there know, you the go. best deal possible, a company that's burning to the ground. <laughs> you can get exactly. It, you can get it for nothing. <laughs> You're also, um, I'm trying to find it, but so your website's really good, um, but you have this blog post or you have a bunch of blog posts on Medium. So Carta Ventures, Carta with a K. K, oh, K. It should be on Substack now. I killed the Medium. Site. Oh, well, I found it on Medium, but um, but yeah, it looks like it is also on Substack, but you're really good with language. So like your thing starts off with like, your, your first sentence is just, is just good. This is a guide intended to give distressed e-commerce e heavy business uh to give distressed e-commerce heavy businesses with 10 to 15 million in revenue a high-level overview of turnaround management basics and resources to dive into. That's a great first sentence. You're telling me exactly what I'm getting. And then you do a really good job of explaining kind of your background with Alex, your co-founder. You say you started these things in your early 20s. You took uh, passive roles or you sold them. And then you like helped turn around ice.com, which is now called Ice Trends. You met on Reddit. Uh, and then you say, we welcome complex opportunities that others are unable or unwilling to tackle. As a result, we can invest in non-control opportunities. We can grow quickly. Uh, but you just basically say, oh, here's another good line. My team and I are responsive, discreet, and avoid pointless formalities. We understand how critical speed is both in turnaround and high-growth environment. And we can tell you within 24 hours if we're a fit. And so you, like, you just do a really good job of being very crystal clear about what your offering is. And you right. are direct, but you're not rude. And it's just a, you, you have a really good voice. And you also like cite a lot of the th books that you read. So you talk about turnaround corporate artistry and you have like a yes. quote from the book. And so anyway, your language is wonderful. Sean said he pays attention to vocabulary. So do I. You, you have really good words you, you, you're, and your rhythm is nice. What did you read to kind of come up with your perspective? And uh, how did you how did you become a good writer? You're, 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 you're quite good at explaining complex things. I think we all grew up during the era of hardcore. I don't know what it was, but for some reason, copywriting and being into copywriting was really popular from 2010 to 2013, maybe earlier. What did you uh, um, What did you learn for that? Or who, where did you turn to for that? Um, one of my friends was just really into it. So I got dragged into it too. And just reading random books. I think there was a compilation of like 100 of the all-time best sales letters. That's back when like people used to distribute swipe files and stuff like that. Right. Um, so you'd just be on a, in a random group and someone would just distribute it and you just rip through it. And that's kind of how I picked it up. It's good. You're you're very good. And what what were some of the other books that you read to learn this topic? Because you you learn this at a very young age. Yeah, I'd say Corporate Turnaround Artistry is one of the greatest books ever. But it's written by my mentor Jeff Sands, and that guy is an absolute beast. He's turned around um, a handful of fairly large nine figure industrials, um, like manufacturing companies, everything from bakeries to I think large restaurants, large restaurant groups, etc. And that guy is in his fifties. I, I think, I hope he doesn't kill me if I got that wrong, but, and he just, he just shows up. So he's done like lumber mills, et cetera. He just shows up and turns the operation around within six to 12 months, absolute machine. And his book gives you, it's probably the most value in a book that I've read in a really long time. It's just like tip after tip after tip. And you can just take it and apply it. Even if your company is not distressed, it'll, it'll just juice profitability, if that makes sense. Um, really awesome. The guy's just a complete machine. I'm convinced you could drop them into anything and he'll just make it more profitable in six months. And that's because what? What is he uh, like world class at doing? What does he do when you drop him in? Um, I'd say he's just very fast at making decisions. He doesn't hold back. In a lot of ways, running a turnaround is like running a startup. You, you don't really have the benefit of sitting around to make decisions, right? Like you're not going to hire McKinsey to run a full blown study to see if you should do something. You're just going to go and do it, right? And maybe you have some light directional data, but you're not going to wait for a ton of data. You're not going to run some crazy Qualtrics survey, right? Um, you're just going to go out and get it done. And that's that's what he's really good at. It's just taking action. He'll show up. For example, when he turned around that that Canadian um, lumber mill, he, he's American. So he just, he moved and, you know, keep in mind he has kids, et cetera, but he still just moved, showed up to a lumber mill in the middle of nowhere, Canada, and turned it around. He's got it done. No one else will really do that, right? And there's a premium for that. What part of this brings you joy? Why are you doing this other than it, that it makes you a lot of money? Uh, I'd just say it's really satisfying and it's fairly repeatable, so... Uh, and I think the speed at which you learn is really, really good, right? Um, and it doesn't require a lot of equity to keep scaling, if that makes sense. So for example, you can probably buy a relatively distressed 
brand doing a hundred million for maybe ten to fifteen million in equity. I uh, we had um we're friends with Moise and Suli Ali, so they right. uh, Moise started um, Native Deodorant, and I was like, Moise, we're in San Francisco. Why are you selling deodorant? Why not like do software and, and be normal, and make more money? And he goes. I'm a merchant, man. I'm a retailer. Like <laughs> this is just, it's in my DNA. Like I just, exactly. I, I make products and I figure out I'm how to make a merchant. It. That's what he Dude, says. I, I've been working on these t-shirts. Uh, I've, I've been working with the t-shirt designer to do things. And now I'm just on the lookout for these quotables. I'm a merchant. <laughs> is a good That's one. what he said. He, he goes, he goes, I'm a merchant. What's that say? It says Carter Kong. And then uh, this is a banana that says IRR, like internal rate of return. That's so funny. <laughs> well, and Moyes also said, he goes, my second phrase, or he goes, uh, my first favorite phrase in the English dictionary, distressed asset. Uh, and, I, and it was funny, but he goes, he goes, I'm a merchant, man. Like I, and it does, I don't know if it's like a, like an immigrant thing or what it is, but like his, cause I know their, their family also owns homes, like uh, lots of single family homes that they rent out and they own gas stations. Right. And a lot of my Indian friends and Pakistani friends all do that. They have uh, gas stations, things like that. And I'm like, I don't know, man, maybe it's just something in the culture where you just like, you're just geared towards small business. But uh, yeah. And like for you, is it the product that you like, or is it just like, I just like making stuff, something that provides value. And I just like optimizing it for profit. I mean, wh what do you think is driving you towards this? Um, yeah, it's in distress side. It's really interesting because it's like a game of chess um, with the existing creditors, the existing cap table, and kind of figuring out how to squish it together to make it work, right? Um, so maybe you have like a really angry senior lender and just convincing them like, hey, you know, give me the position at a decent price. I'll come in, I'll turn it around, and eventually you'll get right side up, or at least you'll make more than you would just liquidating these guys. And then convincing the guys that you're getting the company from, because they're often really upset, right? Like say a company's doing 20 or 30 million, it's still run by the original founders in most cases, and they'll be really emotional about it, right? rightfully so, right? Um, so kind of figuring that side out is really, really interesting. And then obviously the operating end, I, I don't like it as much as my co-founder. He really loves the operating end, but uh, that can be a lot of fun too, just coming in, um, getting rid of the bad apples very quickly, and then building out a team and kind of reviving the culture. There's a story of, um, what's the... Um... What's the famous, um, the famous hedge fund guy who's probably in his nineties now? But you, you guys will know him. Carl, Carl Icahn. Yeah, Carl Icahn. He tells this story yeah. on YouTube, and he's like, "I bought this company, and it was not doing great, but I thought it could do great. And so we owned like twelve floors uh, in this one particular building. And I just went from in one hour from floor to floor to floor, and I laid off the entire floor. And he tells this story laughing. He was like, "It was the greatest thing ever." <laughs> and the, the audience was like, why? You know, you're ruining jobs. And he's like, but I'm making it better. Like, we're going to we're going to have a better outcome. And like, I go both ways with that. I'm like, well, you're kind of just, you know, um, like these hedge fund guys. I'm like, you're just like an Excel monkey and you're just like squeezing every juice you can. You're not providing a lot of value. But I do understand the satisfaction of just like getting something that's not fulfilling potential and achieving potential. You, you know, what story exactly. I'm you know, what story I'm talking about where you like, yeah, I know the exact one. What, yeah, what's I've, it say? I've watched the same video. Did I get it wrong? No, you, you nailed it. You nailed it. Yeah, he goes through floor by floor and, and he, he does exactly what you said. And he's like glowing with like, he's like pride. I'm like, Carl, you're just like ruining these people's Carl, lives. Carl, you're blushing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's Layoffs like, just get him hot and bothered. Dude, yeah, he's like, I'm getting a semi just laying these people off. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it, I guess you're, you're kind of in that position. A, a little bit. I guess it really depends on the company, right? In a lot of cases, you have a few really good apples, people left who are really passionate about the company. They want to see it succeed, and they're the last people left. And then you have all these people who are more or less just leeching off of like the corpse, right? What, um, what do you think about how Elon's done this with Twitter? I think it's great. I think a lot of those people are really self-entitled, and they have no perspective on anything. Um, in a lot of ways, they're, they're kind of like the modern version of those companies in the 1980s that were really fat and just overpaying executives, et cetera. I don't really feel bad for someone who's making up 100 grand losing their job, right? Um, it's more so people working blue collar jobs where they're making 40, 60 grand and they're working their ass off. Um, I definitely don't feel bad for any software engineer making 300 grand who's upset they have to work 10 hours instead of six. I don't disagree with you. I just wish you'd be less of an asshole when he was doing it. <laughs> you don't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. That was kind of pointless. Like, I think he made fun of someone who was disabled or something. That's obviously horrible. It's Do inappropriate. You, so. And you, you mentioned something about uh, being in America and how, like, you know, you like things that are in America. When I, uh, does it ever give you, like, do you have any sense of pride around, like, creating American jobs? Because I know on your website you said we've created or saved 200 different jobs in America, let alone overseas. Do you, are you into, like, that whole made in America thing for, like, the sense of pride thing? Or is it strictly, like, uh, this just 
this the, if it makes sense, it makes dollars. Yeah, I think it it's a mix of both. I think it really does make sense. And I'm I'm Canadian, but I'm obviously grateful for the opportunity that exists in the U.S. You know, Americans just much more gung ho about entrepreneurship. They're more willing to write a check and just get involved um, than Canadians are. If you go to Vancouver, where I'm from, it's a lot of older real estate families. They're not really willing to write a check and, and get into something the way Americans are. They love taking risk. And I really appreciate that about the U.S. Yeah, there, man. There's a there's a thing I've noticed recently about um, what I call like the North Star formula for, for a business. And so um, I like when you can boil down a plan into like a very simple equation. So right. let me give you an example. Um, like Sam with Hampton, um, I think I texted you this, but I just said 10,000 times 10,000. So you just need 10,000 CEOs who are going to pay you $10,000 a year and you have a $100 million business. 10,000 times 10,000. So it's like, can I provide enough value where somebody's willing to pay 10 grand a year? Um, and then can I get 10,000 people to sign up for that value? Your whole business comes down to that one equation, 10,000 times 10,000. Um, when I met, uh, when we were hanging out with Andrew Wilkinson, I was like, how much equity did you put into Tiny originally? And um, I think it was something like, you know, don't quote me on this, but I think it was something like $6 million. He's basically turned $6 million into like $600 million, just as round numbers. And right. Six million into six hundred million. Like if you want to be the next tiny, you, you can just take that thing. I'm turning six into six hundred. Okay, how how are we going to do that? Let's work backwards from that simple formula. Well, I think I would need to compound at forty five percent annually. Okay, how am I going to do that? Well, I need to buy businesses on these terms at these prices. Right. So you, a formula can be very instructive. We have some friends that just raised eighteen million dollars, and we're always like, "What are you going to do with that eighteen million? And they go. We're just trying to figure out how we could turn, uh, or like the, the goal is take this 18 million of equity and turn it into 10 million a year of free cash flow. It's like, okay, like that's a, a clarifying right. equation. And um, I'm curious, Mitab, for you, like in a best case scenario, how will this have played out? So like you 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 go to the start. Uh, I don't know, how much, how much equity did you and your co-founder put in as like your seed capital to get your whole business off the ground? Um. Well, it's kind of weird for Carter because we both had a few exits beforehand. Like he'd sold a company that he got to kind of low eight figures um, in his early 20s. He'd put a bit of cash, but we put in, I want to say a couple hundred grand, like two, 300 grand to okay. start making investments. So you, and so, and maybe you've put in more over time. I'm not sure, but like whatever that's. Oh yeah, we, we reinvest everything more or less. Uh, yeah, but like just the out of pocket, like initial, not, not reinvestments from the proceeds of mm -hmm. what you've been doing. But just have you had to take something out of the checking account or savings account just to 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 re to recapitalize the business in any way? Or no, it was like two, three hundred grand, and then anything else we put in was reinvestments from what that two or three hundred grand has made us. It was reinvestments from what that two, three hundred grand that we put in initially was. Okay, amazing. So you're gonna go from let's say three hundred grand, and like if this all plays out the way you want, um, you know, fast forward, I don't know, the 10 years or however long you you plan to to kind of do this. What would be the big win for you? How much would the portfolio be worth for this to be like a, you know, a home run outcome for you guys? Yeah, we are really goal driven. Um, we're a little bit weird that way, but we both want to tackle increasingly large distress deals. So that's what we get pleasure from, I guess, just kind of fun doing it. And we'll just keep doing it until we don't have fun. Um, so our goal really is get this floral company, I think, can usually get to $100 million in top line. Um, like our, our allowable customer acquisition costs will go up by 30, 40% once we finish with a few manufacturing transitions. Hold on. So you don't, um, you don't have, you're not goal driven. What does that mean? I, I don't even, that's like not English to me. How do you, how do you function without, <laughs> without goals? I, I just like to do hood rat stuff. Just whatever is fun, right? <laughs> Dude, he's like a, dom you're like the dominatrix of PE. You just get, you just get pleasure. You just get, you get, you get pleasure. For like, like, Oh yeah, you like that? Even <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, hey. that's going on. That's my new LinkedIn subheader. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you just love the act, man. You just you just like the act of uh, you know someone um uh you 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 whisper whisper IRR into your ears and you're gonna get weak at the knees. <laughs> well, it's just fun because you get to learn from people like like you two or, or hang out with other people that are really interesting. Um, and and that's really exciting too, right? Like but don't you but don't you don't you have um. Like a like a you know every, a lot of people who get in business they have like one day I want to make all this money so I can buy you know a thousand acres or I want to create a school that does this or I want to be able to make sure that everyone in my family never right. has to a pay dream for medical instead bills. of a goal a yeah. dream instead my of a initial goal, yeah. dream my initial dream and my co-founders this before we met it just turned out we had like the same target 
was to make like five thousand dollars a month. That was it. That's how it starts, man. That's how it starts. And <laughs> then you realize really that. Uh, and then you realize it. You know. You, you know it, what I've noticed. I I have all the same. Hold goals. on, hold on. I, what I I've don't noticed is this, dude. I, you didn't start like this. I had the same no, no, thing, and the goals said, always change. But you said when you started, you guys have had wins under your belt. So no, no, no. You, I mean before that. Like, oh, uh, okay, okay. Like early on, like when I did my first thing, I was like, I'm going to be stoked if I make sixty grand a year. Okay, yeah, of course, of course, of course. But what about now? You know, like what's like the what's like the vision, the long term vision that you you that kind of keeps you excited? Maybe it, sometimes it's, sometimes it's buying shit, giving shit away, helping your family, whatever. Right. I think getting this one portfolio company to the next level. Uh, either selling it or re-leveraging it, taking out cash, and then raising a large fund is probably like our, our immediate short-term goal in the next two, three years. Dude, that's when so, I was in college. That's so not what I thought it was going to be. Sorry, go ahead. When I, when I was in college, uh, one semester, me and my my buddy Trevor and our, our other friend Dan, we we had read the the card counting book. This was before the movie came out, Twenty One. But oh my the god, book, the book Bringing Down the House was out, and. Um, and we were like, oh, not only are we going to count cards, we decided to create an underground blackjack club on campus. And so we started preparing and we were like, and, and because we had read this card counting book, instead of just doing the obvious thing of being like, cool, let's just invite some some friends over to play blackjack at low stakes. Let's see how it goes and we'll go from there. Right? That's how you would do it if you had any, like, any ounce of IQ in your brain. Instead... We were like, okay, let's go buy this like fancy blackjack table. Okay, cool. We, we now we're in the hole, and we've got this like fancy thing. And then let's run all these practice simulations to see how bad we could get beat. And then what if somebody comes and count cards? How, what's our security going to be? We were worried about all this stuff that didn't matter. And we spent no joke. We spent like the entire semester at college, which is like that semester cost each of us probably like forty grand just to be there. And instead of focusing on the forty grand that we put into being there. We were doing this thing, and I remember one night we were calculating. We were like, oh, my God. If we do this, we could make $3,000. And then we all started giggling like, oh, like, can you imagine that? Like, we were like, dude, what if we made 3000 And yeah, we just I like, think that's 1000 each. And we were so pumped about this. And it was like, it just took over our mind like a mind virus for, for, for three or four months. It made no sense. But it was like, you know, it was the humble beginnings of totally. scheming. It was like the it was the first of many schemes to come with this same group of people. We ended up starting a, a company together and, and did many more things together. But like that first taste of the scheme and how hilariously bad your plan and your goals are. Like now when I look back, I look back with a lot of fondness on that. Totally. Yeah, it, it makes sense. It's always starts small. And then you... What are you like? You bought you bought the safe to keep the cash before you even had the cash, and the cash never <laughs> even came. And then we never, yeah, we never even ran the ran the club because we like we were too worried about getting kicked out of school because we found out how illegal it was. Well, basically, we had one simulation where I was the again we were big into these simulations, and I walked in and I played. I lost a hundred dollars, and then I go, "Give me all the money, or I'm going to tell people about this club." <laughs> and then I was like, oh yeah, what are we going to do if somebody does that? Like at any point in time, somebody could just literally take all the money because there's no recourse. What are we going to do? Call the cops and tell them about, that somebody stole from our illegal gambling exactly. club. <laughs> and we were Dude, like, oh, this won't work. Before I sold my first company, I was using some type of like mint.com style service. And there was like a thing where you could manual, you know, you connect all your accounts and it shows you your, your net worth and whatever. And they had this option where you could manually add something. So I manually <laughs> added this really big number and I would log into this every day, like six months in it. advance. And I'm like, sick, this is awesome. And I remember <laughs> like when the money then actually came in, I was like, damn, I, I kind of like felt most of that joy in that six <laughs> months leading up, just like, I, I kind of tricked myself into already believing this was real. The the, the simulation kind of gave me like a lot of the joy. Uh, it's pretty cool. How you can kind of like trick yourself into believing these things are true, and you get a significant amount of satisfaction right. from that fake thing compared to the real thing. Yeah, you you because what people want is the feeling. You don't want the thing. If you if you ever say, "Oh, I really want X to happen," why do you want X? If you if you just keep asking why do you want that the the, the obvious answer why do you want anything a, a relationship uh, money whatever it is to have a six pack whatever it's some feeling it's a sense of accomplishment it's a feeling of relief of real of, of less anxiety less stress whatever it is and then you realize 
oh, it's not the thing I want. It's the feeling. And then you might be able to get the feeling through literally like faking it. You might be able to get the feeling through something much simpler. That's not going to take you, you know, seven years and a bunch of heartache to get there. And, uh, and also if you've never had that feeling before, even when, it, when that thing happens, it'll be your first time having that feeling and you'll suck at it, which is why a bunch of people feel after they get success, they get like kind of let down because the feeling wasn't as, totally. as great as they, they wanted it to be. The anticipation was better than the result. And the reason isn't because the feeling is actually a letdown. It's because it's the first time they've let themselves try that feeling and the muscle is just very, very weak. And so, uh, yeah, big, big life tip is to realize like what you want is the feeling and then start practice having that on a daily basis through like much smaller things. Yeah, it works. Um, Maytab, you, I'm looking at you on Twitter. You have 5,000 followers. I think that being popular on social media, doesn't really matter in most all of business. It, it, in fact, sometimes it's like negatively correlated to how popular you are. But in your case, I, at least I know with Andrew, like when he's buying a lot of mm -hmm. companies, having some, um, like, you know, it's basically being on Twitter is a billboard for him. So when he reaches out right. to someone, they're like, oh, I, you know, I think I've heard of you. Fine. Let's have a conversation for how good it seems like you're doing and how smart you are. Your um, your social presence is significantly smaller. Is there a reason uh, for that? No, I just don't really like it. Um, I, I just like to post content about stuff that I actually care about. Um, and I'm fairly open. And then I guess, too, on the distress side, when you're buying a business, they're more of a forced seller, right? Um, and when you're talking to a lot of these senior lenders who you're working with, it's a lot of guys that are in their 50s or 60s and they're very conservative, traditional, um, like banker types, right? They're not, they don't really care about social media or anything like that. So I mean, I'm sure it does help with deal flow on the growth equity side or buying healthy businesses, but um, I've just never really been into it. Yeah, I mean, you have, you have, you do tweet interesting stuff. It looks like, what's a Daniel Roth watch? It looks like a pretty fancy, fancy I'm watch just, that you just I'm just bought. a nerd about like, Neo vintage and vintage watches, and then as well as some newer brands, but mostly smaller ones. Um, it's just kind of it's a lot of it's like angel investing. It like if you buy into an early independent brand, um, which is just like a watchmaker basically going at it. Sometimes they can appreciate in value significantly, and you get a pretty cool watch for the money. Plus, you support a small business; they'll build you whatever you want. So it's like a win-win. Yeah, your your social media is actually pretty cool. I'm gonna follow you, but you have some interesting stuff. But like compared to some of the stuff you're doing, I know a whole lot of people in the DTC space that are significantly bigger totally. than you and are much more of a little pipsqueak and don't ever walk <laughs> the walk like you like you are. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I know what you mean. Uh, leave us with this example of this Weight Watchers thing. So uh, explain explain what happened with Weight, Weight Watchers, then we'll, we'll wrap so it up. Super high level Weight Watchers was not doing so well. And this guy at this tiny firm not, not super small, but relatively small. He convinced Oprah to join them and they absolutely crush it. That's the very high level overview of what he did. <laughs> and so this guy, uh, what, 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 like, what were the numbers? So they, what did they buy? I'd have to go pull it up. And then what, what I, I'd become? have to pull it up. Okay. Um, so how did this guy know Oprah, by the way? That sounds like, you know, oh, it's simple. He got Oprah on board. That that's not, doesn't sound that easy. Yeah, 2015 Oprah is uh, was a big deal. That's Pete. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's peak uh, Oprah. That's like 2012, 2012 Obama. Like, you know? yeah, that's peak <laughs> Oprah. So in 2015, he did a deal with Winfrey to acquire a 10% stake in Weight right. Watchers. Since then, the company stock has soared by almost 600%. They sold $1 billion of Weight Watcher stock, and Oprah gained at least $400 million so far. Okay, that's pretty impressive. Um, it will go down as one of the best private equity deals ever. Over the 19 years, they put $226 million in to Weight Watchers and got $5.37 billion out. $4.7 billion of realized profits. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> Not including the stock that they still Especially hold. at that scale. But they only bought 10% of it? Uh, um, I thought they bought more. I think they kept buying more over time. I thought they kept deploying uh, okay. more and more cash into it. Dude, we have to do a pod on Oprah. Like I, I love her. I grew up watching her. And like... I, 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 you know, she's 70 now. I just looked her up or she's 68 or something. Uh, we forget, or I forget like how big of a baller she is. I'm like, just Googling. It's like Oprah buys another thousand acres and in Hawaii. She came from nothing like, she, and she bootstrapped. She just, like she basically, you know, got, got her net worth to be something absolutely insane. Yeah. What, what's her, what's her story? So, uh, what, what, what do we know about the beginning of her story? Uh, bor born in a really poor town, abused growing up, et cetera. And then absolutely crushes it. And she should run for president. I would totally. I think she, <laughs> I think she was born in like an abusive family. Mm -hmm. 
And like, I think, I think there was even she like, she got some, like pregnant at 14 or something. Yeah. Right? And I think that there was some like sexual mm-hmm. assault or some, 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 like some like horrible, horrible. Uh, tr- tragic stuff. And then at age 24, I think she becomes like a weather woman or like a, like a, what, whatever they call it, where you're a news person, but you're not actually in the office. You're like right. out on the street. On the street. Yeah. Um, she did that. And then eventually when she's like 32 or 33, she gets a talk show. But it's not like a hit right off the bat, but it slowly starts picking up. And then eventually she like makes some like groundbreaking deal. She did like one of these groundbreaking deals, sort of like Michael Jordan did with mm-hmm. Nike, uh, what Lucas Films did with Star Wars, where it's like, you know, we'll just take a percentage of the upside. And uh, and then that like turned out to be like one of the most, you know, one of the best deals of all time. And and it's worked out. And, you and know, she did like, this all back I, when I, people I, were very, very racist. It's not like now. Yeah, she's ben, from, uh, like I think it was out of Nashville, Tennessee, uh, that she's doing this. So in the mm-hmm. South, and she kind of killed it. We, we we need a how to take over the world episode on Oprah. What's what's going on? Where is our where is our definitive Oprah episode? Why why have you not done this already? It's a, it's a real question for you, Ben. <laughs> uh, put it on the list, Sean. You put, on, you put it on the list. You, you put it at the top of the list. Let's the list. do this after this after this episode <laughs> is done. You, you got yeah. it. I, I'm buying my Oprah. I'm on Amazon.com buying Oprah biography. Is there right an now. Oprah biography? I would totally buy that. Of course there is. There has to be. I, I mean, I, she's she's the best. I, I'm a big fan of her. And she like did this all out of Chicago. So I think she still owns like the penthouse and the Sears Tower, which is like, you know, one of the largest buildings uh, in, in the world. Uh, but no, she's the best. You know, I always forget about this. So like I'm in Austin and there's all these nerds talking about crystals. You know, you go to a therapist and they like recommend a crystal. Uh, like there's like pretty woo woo shit out right. here. Um, she, she was pretty woo woo, but for some reason she made it very, very likable. Like you guys remember that book, The Secret, where it's just like it's like if you think about it enough and like put it in <laughs> place in your brain, the universe comes, will grant you this. Yeah, yeah. The, and like she like would she was talking about that stuff before any of that stuff was even popular. And for some reason, when she does it, it's very tasteful. Other times, my friends do it. It looks like, you know, they're one of those women wearing like a Coachella brown hat, uh, like, you know, and it's not cool at all. You know what I'm yeah, talking about? Those wide brim hats. When I ever see one of those flag. with turquoise jewelry, I, I yeah, run exactly. away. I'm good, out. Good choice. You know, if, you wear, if you're wearing cowboy boots, turquoise jewelry. If I jewelry, see turquoise, I'm <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah. No wide brim hats, hats for me. I'm out. If you, if you wear one of those things, I, I'm not part of this. But for some reason, when she does it, I'm in. Well, that's what I want to know. Like, I think the the story I've heard is like grew up in these terrible conditions, overcame and became super successful. But I literally want to know, like, what was the successful part? Like, uh, meaning, how did she get her break? And then, like, what led her? What was she doing? Was it literally just better content? Like, was she just that damn good and dynamic as a talk show host? Was it like the Microsoft IBM deal where they like, you know, how did Microsoft take over the world? It's like, well, they cut this really great deal for the operating system where they could be, you know, with multiple providers at once and and they use IBM to bootstrap and that's how they got bigger. Like, it's like, was there like a growth hack? Was there a um, a smart, you know, deal that she struck? Was it uh, the timing? Because like, you know, those shows, you know, cable started spreading into every home in the country and like, she was one of the top three shows and just like at, she got to surf the cable wave or whatever. Like wh- I want to know what actually led her to the, like, the mega, mega fame. Uh, what were the actual, those, those things, which is not like a simple answer, but um, that's what I'm actually curious about because you could like in the air, in the topics that I know about um, those stories are always the most interesting. And I feel like when you, when I go into other topics, like I was like, oh, Maytab, like what happened? He was like, oh, started off bad. Now the best. It's like, yeah, but act two, the middle part, uh, that's the part that uh, anybody who right. actually wants to make shit happen in their life, you want to focus on act totally. two. Like Hollywood focuses on act one and three, right? Like the, the, the bad origin and then the, the happy ending, but it's the montage, the training montage when like you go from like scrawny to strong, the training montage that they speed up through is the part where all the interesting shit happens. I already told you, Gino, I go, Billy of the Week on Wednesday, Oprah, <laughs> I'm on it. Yeah. <laughs> There's this really cool book um, called Messy Middle. Have you guys read Me- Messy Middle? It's by, uh, what's the, uh, Scott Belsky. Scott Belsky. Yeah. The most dreamy guy of all dreamy guys. Scott Belsky is the man. <laughs> Scott Belsky basically started... Um, there's a guy named Scott Belsky. He started Behance, which is uh, where developer uh, designers mm-hmm. could host their portfolio. He started it, bootstrapped it, had a $175 million exit, 
before it became very successful, he said he had like fifty thousand dollars and he invested like fifteen thousand into Pinterest at a three million valuation, fifteen thousand into Uber at a three million dollar valuation. Each of those, you know, fifty to one hundred million dollar outcome. Plus, he owned seventy five percent of his company when it sold for. $175 million. So very, very, very successful. And now he's, it, it's looking like he's going to become the next CEO of Adobe. So huge deal. He's got this awesome book called The Messy Middle. And it talks about how like, you know, starting things can be somewhat easy. But once you start that, then there's uh once you, you start it and then there's the middle and you have the end and the end's the kind of the easy part, right. you know, things are just kind of working. But the messy middle is that 10 year period where it's like, is this working? Is this not working? And it's a really cool book on how to like navigate that period. And it's, and, and I love that title, the messy middle. Yeah. Great title. Great guy. He came on the pod once a long time ago. We should bring him back. Um, but yeah, he's on your like Mount Rushmore of dreamy dudes. I feel like uh, you got Huberman up there. You got Belsky. Who else? It's basically Dude, like men with strong and good chins. Looking. <laughs> yeah, you gotta have, yeah <laughs> jawlines. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You need a you need a good jawline and, and a clear cut jaw. <laughs> Dude, have you seen Scott Belsky's jaw, man? He's got a, a strong. Chin. I know what I'm googling after this. Chin. Talk, talk about <laughs> talk about not a distressed asset. That guy's chiseled. <laughs> yeah, He's a, that's a blue chip stock right there. Um, yeah, he also just dresses well. And I feel like dressing well is this like really easy thing to do that nobody does. <laughs> and, uh, and he does an amazing job of it. Especially in tech. I know. He's he, he's the man. Because he lives in New York, dude. All those guys are stylish. He lives in New York. Yeah. So he's got that leg up. Um, dude, I've never been to his house, but I've been to his house. I know exactly what a guy like that's house looks like. It's basically... I can picture it so clearly in my mind of how immaculate like the design is of that guy's house. He invested in the hustle. He wrote us a very small check, and I've got the paperwork for where to send the docs to. Immediately, I looked up and I like saw <laughs> the, the house, thing. and I could tell you, I could tell you off air, it's exactly what you're describing. You didn't even des- you didn't even describe it other than using you some know. big words, and it's exactly how hey, you're Sam, describing. Sam, you want to hear the something funny? funny? Is I, w- I I tried to uh, in 2018 when we were hunting for deal flow. I like stumbled across the hustle. I'm like, this is awesome. I should try to invest in this. So I messaged you on Facebook, but no reply. So, <laughs> oh, I'm oh, sorry. You, wow. should go, you should go pull it up. It's just kind of funny. This is your revenge. No, moment. sorry, sorry. It's, <laughs> it's kind of funny. If I would have got, that would have been a good investment. But it would, it would have. I'm sorry. You and maybe you would have known Scott. You know, I could have helped you connect with my with my boyfriend Scott. <laughs> maybe you too could have zillowed Scott's house. <laughs> wow, this is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, we're uh, not. We're, we're friendly. We're not friends, <laughs> but we've. Go- I've googled his house. He's not googled mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can tell you what type of couch he has, though. Um, but dude, thanks for coming on, no, thank man. Thank you. It was uh, fun. You're awesome. I'm gonna go and find that. I'm, I just pulled up Facebook. I'm gonna find that message. It's just kind of uh, funny. It's from 2018. It's like, hey, uh, I'm an angel investor. Please let me invest. <laughs> I like what you're doing. What's your? Just here. A, does your last name start with yeah, a B? Yeah, Bogle. If you just type in B H O G L. Oh, yeah, I see it. Sorry there about was, that. There, see, good deal flow. Would have been there. Uh, <laughs> Should have messaged you more. Well, you're, Should have asked you. Dude, I saw a um, a post on Reddit yesterday. It was a map. I don't know if this is, this might be fake news, but it was the top. It was like one of the most popular popular posts mm-hmm. on Reddit yesterday. It's a heat map that shows the average life to, life expectancy by town, and there's literally a twenty year age difference between like. New York, uh, California versus like the Crazy. South. Um, it's like, you know, people in the South are dying at like 60 something and people on the coast who are living like, you know, sort of the yoga and salads lifestyle are living till they're 80 on average. And, and then you can see these small pockets like in Florida, it's like the retirement community where people like migrate right. into. Yeah. Like they're Jewish also New Yorkers. living for a long Crazy. time. Yeah. The Jewish New Yorkers who moved down there, they're living for a long time. Everything around it is surrounded by, the walking dead of people who are going to die at 60 something. And uh, there's like, like, it's like Boca Raton kills it. And then like Jort Lauderdale is like (laughs) as a 30 year uh, shorter life expectancy. I I asked my data guy, I said, please overlay the map of Chick-fil-A's. And it was a perfect sequence to like, (laughs) to to, to the the dying early crowd, which is unfortunate for me because I love Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is not healthy. Well, we're screwed. Um, <laughs> dude, thanks for doing this. We appreciate you. Yeah, no worries. Thank you.